Stories from Seeker After Truth by Idris Shah Elephant Meat Ibrahim Khabas relates this instruction narrative, which has been used to test the understanding of students of Sufism. In company with a number of Sufis, I was making a journey on shipboard when we were wrecked, and I found myself, with some others, just able to reach a desolate shore. We did not know where we were, neither did we have any food. It seemed that we would be likely to perish, as days passed without any sign of succour. We discussed the position and decided that each of us would make a vow to do some good or to abandon some evil which cut him off from his lord. In this way, we thought, the exercise of sincerity might be the means of providing escape from helplessness. Each one made his oath. One, that from now on he would carry out fasting. Another, that he would pray so many times each day. And yet another one, that he would carry out pilgrimages on foot. Everyone, in this way, made his declaration and compact that he would abstain from some indulgence or else that he would do something of religious worth. Now, it came to me to declare my vow, and I was asked by the others to speak. I wanted to make my promise, and it came into my mind, without any thought or consideration, that I would say, I shall not eat any elephant meat. The others exclaimed, This is no time for joking and amusement, no time for such things, as we remain in this danger of death. I answered, By God, I did not say this in the spirit you mention. While you were talking, I thought over all the possible good actions I might do and all the bad things I might avoid, and something prevented me from choosing one of them. And what I have just said simply came to me without any reflection, and I said it. It is possible that some divine wisdom has put the idea into my head and has allowed me to speak in this way. The party then decided to explore further into the land where they were cast to look for food. After arranging for a central point at which to reassemble, and that anything found should be shared, they started their search. They had not gone far when my friend found a young elephant, and decided that they could survive if they killed it to eat. The animal was slaughtered, and the meat was cooked over a fire. Although they asked me to share the food, I was unable to do so, and I answered, You are all witnesses that I have made the vow to abstain from this very thing, and I cannot break that oath. It may even be that God has caused me to think of this particular vow so that I might die. In any case, it is unlawful to break my oath. After eating, everyone lay down to sleep. And soon we heard the trumpeting of an infuriated elephant bearing down upon us. The noise was so great that the earth shook and all were terrified. Since it seemed obvious that everyone was to be killed, they gave up hope and murmured their confession of faith as people do when faced by death. Now the elephant, when he reached us, extended his trunk to each traveller in turn, smelling him. One by one, as he smelt the odour of roast elephant meat, he stamped the man to death until he came to me. I lay on the ground, repeating my shahada confession, in mortal terror. The elephant smelt me again and again, not as hastily as he had done with the others. Then he caught me up in his trunk, and I imagined that he was going to kill me in some way different from the others. But he placed me on his back where I sat, and started to move away, sometimes walking, sometimes running, covering a long distance. I was extremely uncomfortable on the animal's back, yet I began to think that perhaps I might be able in some way to escape. It was dawn when the elephant took me down and placed me on the earth, running off in the direction from which we had come. I could not understand the reason for his actions, and was still in fear but eventually he vanished over the horizon. Giving thanks for my deliverance, I offered prayers and thanks to the Lord, and when I felt the heat of the day, I looked up and realized that I was beside a broad highway. I went along the road, and after some time came to a populous city, 
where I related all that had happened to the people, who were most surprised, and said that it was a distance of ordinarily several days from which the elephant had brought me. After spending some time in that city, and recovering from my exhaustion, I was able to return to my own land in safety and health. Recognising it A group of people all died at once in a catastrophe and were surprised to find themselves in a world very much like this one. All kinds of entertainments and every possible facility were provided. They were amazed to learn that they were in hell. Those who wanted exciting lives got them. People who desired money received it. Ambitions of all kinds were fulfilled. There were many demons in attendance who helped everyone to do what they wanted. One day, known as Complaints Day, a number of the inmates went to the controlling demon and said, We have a wonderful life. Parties, riches, excitement. But we seem to be withering away, becoming unattractive to each other little by little, losing the belongings that come to us so easily. Yes, said the fiend. Hell, isn't it? Fahima and the Prince There was once in the city of Basra a very beautiful and intelligent girl, expert at solving conundrums, and usually able to predict people's actions far better than they themselves ever could. Her name, in fact, was Fahima, the Understander. She had inherited a large fortune, and all the young men of the city, as well as a number of older ones, wanted to marry her, most of them hoping to get hold of her money. Women, too, sought her friendship. Those who did not want her wealth were curious about the source and action of her remarkable cleverness, and so Fahima was always besieged by suitors, well-wishers, idlers, and people trying to sell her things. Fahima shut herself away and very sensibly made it difficult for people to get to know her. Then one day, when she was standing for a moment on the turret of her castle, briefly lit by the rays of the sun, a certain prince came by and saw her. He decided that he would marry her. The prince camped outside the castle and laid siege to the fair lady. He sang her songs, played on the lute, displayed his manly figure in a great variety of splendid robes and sent her poems and messages. In between all these activities, he broke off to go hunting, withdrew to practice sword fighting, rode into the city to inspect the latest cargoes from distant lands and generally acted as princes of that time usually did. Fahima, as we know, was wise and she both liked what she had seen and heard of the prince, and understood him better than he understood himself. One day, therefore, when she went out of the castle and found herself seized and borne back to the prince's own castle, she was not as surprised as some people might have been. When he threw her into a dungeon without any discussion, she realized that he had done this because he had convinced himself that she would not marry him until he had shown his assertiveness and power. Because, as you will have gathered, he was in the habit of coming to conclusions about situations without sufficient reflection. After some days, the prince went to Fahima's prison and called through the bars, Fahima, I want to marry you. I have money, I am young, and strong, and handsome, and I have you in my power, and can do anything I like with you. Moreover, I can please you, and make you an interesting and devoted husband. Fahima answered, Not by money, nor by honey, not by guile, nor by wile not through boasting or even roasting. Day after day the prince went to the dungeon, and a similar kind of conversation took place. 
He suggested all the reasons why he thought she should marry him, and she rejected them all. Finally, other things began to occupy his mind. After some months, he decided to go to Baghdad for a time, and word of this came to Fahima through the gossip of her jailer. But Fahima had not been idle. All that time she had been tunneling, and she now had a means of escape to the outside world. As soon as the prince left, Fahima went down her secret passage to freedom, and, hiring the fastest horses in Basra, made her way to the capital, arriving long before the indolent prince, who made his way there in state and with many halts to have food prepared and for all kinds of other reasons. When the prince arrived in Baghdad, he visited friends. He went hunting with hawks and gave lavish entertainment and generally comported himself as princes did in those days. One day, strolling past a luxurious mansion, he saw a beautiful girl standing by a window. He thought, That lovely creature is almost exactly like Fahima of Basra. And well he might, for it was the very same girl who had established herself in Baghdad for the very purpose of meeting the prince. The prince instantly contrived to meet the lady and asked her to marry him. She agreed. They were wed. Faima became a princess, and she gave birth in due course to a baby girl. The prince was delighted, of course. After a time, however, he decided to go on his travels again, and he journeyed to Tripoli. Fahima, leaving her child with a trusted servant, went there too and took a sumptuous house. Again the prince saw her. Again he found that he wanted to marry her, thinking that she was another woman. And again they were married. This time they had a baby boy, and the prince was, of course, delighted. When wanderlust again arose in the prince's breast, he took ship to Alexandria. Needless to say, Fahima also went, and everything went as before. The prince saw her, asked her to marry him, married her, and they had another child. After a year or two, the prince felt homesick for Basra, and he embarked for that city, leaving his wife, as he thought, in Alexandria. Fahima chartered a faster ship and arrived back in time to be sitting in her dungeon when the prince went to see her. When he saw her, the prince began, for the first time, to feel remorse and distress. Oh, Fahima, he cried, I would stay still like to marry you, and I have treated you badly, leaving you imprisoned here for so many years. But I, I am not really the same man. I am even worse. I have done things which I should not have done, and I am unworthy of you, and indeed of the others about whom you know nothing. Fahima said, Are you prepared to tell me the truth about what has happened while you have been away? I might as well said the prince, but it will make little difference. Clever as you are, even you would not be able to think of a solution to my problems, brought about by foolishness and lack of reflection. Fahima said, If you would tell me the whole story, omitting no single detail, I might be able to suggest something. The prince then related how he had met and married beautiful girls in Baghdad, Tripoli, and Alexandria, how he had three children, and how he wished he had acted differently. Were it not for me, said Fahima, you would have done all these things in an irrevocable form. If that had happened, you would not have been able to undo your folly, and others would have been harmed through your own selfishness. As it happens, I am able to unravel the thread for you. What has been done cannot be undone, cried the prince. And as for the rest of your speech, I do not understand it at all. Go to your drawing room, 
said Fahima, and wait there until someone is announced, someone whom you must instantly have admitted to your presence. The prince did as she asked, and in an hour or so, dressed in all her finery and leading their three children, Fahima appeared at the castle gate. It was some time before the prince could understand that the four women were in fact one, and that all of his three children had the same mother. But when he realized what Fahima had done, in spite of what he had done to her, he was overwhelmed with joy and became a completely reformed character. They all lived happily ever afterwards. Intelligence and Obedience There was once a Sufi teacher who was approached by two men who begged him to allow them to become his disciples. He agreed on the understanding that they were on three months probation. For nearly 90 days, the master gave them no tasks, told them no stories, invited them to no meetings. Then, when their time was nearly up, he called the two into the courtyard of his house and said, I want each one of you to go outside where there are camels. Each of you is to take the leading rein of one camel and to bring it to me, climbing the wall and making the camel climb the wall. The first disciple said, Master, it is written that man must exercise his intelligence. My intelligence tells me that what you ask is impossible, and my good sense tells me that you have only asked this in order to test whether I am intelligent or not and whether I use my common sense or not. Then, said the master, you will not attempt to bring the camel over the wall. I shall not, said the disciple, asking forgiveness for appearing to disobey. Then the master turned to the second disciple and said, What is your answer to my request? Without a word, the second disciple started to go out of the courtyard through the gate. The master followed, motioning to the first disciple to accompany him. When they were all outside the high wall where the camels stood, the second disciple took the leading rein of one of the beasts and walked it to the outside wall. He then made an attempt to climb the wall, with the camel's rein still in his hand, making encouraging noises to it. When it was obvious that he could not succeed, the master said, Return this camel to its place and follow me within. A few minutes later, when the three men were again standing within the courtyard, the master said, Everyone knows, since the earliest days of humanity, that the path demands various capacities. These include the use of intelligence and the application of common sense, and also obedience. Obedience is as important as intelligence and common sense. Everyone who is ever taught will know that almost everyone will try to use intelligence and common sense in preference to obedience, thus putting these three qualities out of balance. The vast majority of humanity considers that to obey is less important than to think of a way out of a situation. But it is in fact known that none of these things is more important than another, except in the performance. Now we can find men of intelligence anywhere, but where can we find people of obedience? The first disciple is dismissed because he placed too much importance upon intellect. The second is retained because he did not jump to the obvious conclusion which men tell each other is the best thing to do and yet which as often as not deprives them of full capacity. He turned to the second disciple and asked him why he had tried to do the impossible. The disciple said, I knew that you knew it was impossible, so that there was no harm in obedience to see where it led. I knew that the easy way out was to say, It is impossible, I shall not attempt it because of common sense and that only a superficial person would think in that way. Everyone has as much common sense as would be needed to refuse to obey. Therefore, 
I knew that you were testing my obedience and refusal to choose easy options. Take care. There was once a man who wanted to become the disciple of a certain Sufi sheikh. In fact, he was not prepared to travel the path in the correct order of events, being excitable and greedy. He had, in fact, the characteristics which disable the majority of people from completing the journey. The sheikh, however, gave him a chance. Since there was a possibility that he might see, through the consequences of his own flaws in action, that he would have to adopt a completely different approach and become calmer and more considerate. After some time, however, this disciple became quite frustrated with the sheikhs putting him into situations where nothing seemed to happen, and he decided that the teacher was therefore useless. So he cast around for some other teacher, one who would fit in better with his own assumptions about himself. Naturally, he found one. Now, this second teacher was nothing less than a maniac who hated the first one. When he had gained the disciple's confidence and inflamed him with promises of secrets and success, he said, Now I shall test you. If you pass the test, you will be able to scale the greatest heights of spiritual understanding. The disciple begged to be tested to any extent. Very well, continued the false teacher. Go and bring me the heart of your first master. The disciple, his head completely turned with the wonderful nature, as he imagined it, of the new teacher, went and killed the sheikh and cut out his heart. Overcome with excitement, full of greed for secrets and mystical attainment, he was running to the false teacher's house with the heart when he stumbled and nearly fell. And then, as if from the severed heart which he was carrying, came the voice of the murdered sheikh. Gently, my son, overcome your carelessness and greed. The Monster There is a story of old, once told by a people who hearkened to wisdom. As the members of that community do not now listen to meanings, it really matters little whether they are told the story or not, or have preserved it or not. But to proceed, the story concerns four men who lived in the same neighbourhood and had all studied the theoretical and practical arts to such an extent and under the greatest masters of knowledge that everyone was convinced that they had reached the apogee of knowledge. It so happened that the four came to the conclusion that they should travel and exercise their knowledge. For has it not been said that he who has knowledge and does not use it, it is as if he were a fool? In short, the friends became wayfarers, seeking opportunities to act upon their knowledge. It also happens to be true, as has been known both before and since, that three of the scholars were deeply versed in arts and sciences, in theory and practice, while the fourth, while less celebrated in customary terms, was well endowed with understanding. After some days, during which they had come to know one another more and more, and when they had had many debates and discussions, the three well-matched scholars felt that their companion was nothing like as well endowed with learning as they and they tried to make him leave their party to return home. When he refused to do so, they said, It is typical of an insensitive one like you, bereft of appreciation of the great capacities which we others have, to persist in representing yourself as our equal. But they allowed him to accompany them, although they excluded him thenceforth from their important deliberations. Now it so happened that one day, while the four were walking along, they came upon a heap of bones and other remains of an animal by the roadside. Aha, said the first scholar, I can perceive through my knowledge that this is the carcass of a lion. And I, said the second scholar, 
have the knowledge to reconstitute its body in a viable form. As for me, said the third scholar, I have the capacity to reanimate things, and I can bestow life upon it. They decided to apply their respective powers in these ways. The fourth scholar, however, caught the others by the sleeve and said, I must inform you that although you object to my skills and theoretical abilities, I am yet a man of understanding. This is indeed, as you have perceived, the remains of a lion. Bring it back to life and it will destroy us all if it can. But the three other scholars were far too interested in exercising their theories and getting on with their practices. Within a few minutes, the mound of skin and bone was reconstituted into a living, breathing, clearly very dangerous lion. While the practitioners of learning were busy with their operation, the fourth scholar climbed a tall tree. As he watched, the lion fell on his companions and devoured them. Then it roared away into the wilderness, and the only survivor of the expedition came down from his tree and made his way back to his country. The Skill That Nobody Has There was in far-off times a youth who lived near a small town in a mighty empire. He was bright and intelligent, and he impressed everyone with his ability to learn and his good neighborliness. He lived with his widowed mother. One day his mother said to him, Anwar, for that was his name, Anwar, you really should be thinking about settling down in life. True, you help the farmers like other lads. I know that you sit at home and make baskets like other people when there's nothing else to do. But you should either get married or set forth to seek your fortune in the wider world. At any rate, that's what I think about things. My dear mother, cried the boy, that's exactly what I want to do. I could stay at home and work permanently for one of the farmers, or I could go and try something really reckless like travelling to very distant parts. But before attempting anything like that, I've made up my mind that I shall both stay fairly near to home and also become someone of importance. I shall marry the daughter of the emperor and live happily ever after. People like us, said the old lady, do not usually have such ideas. Why, hardly any of us ordinary working folk have ever seen the emperor, much less his daughter. And who are you, may I ask, to go to our monarch and ask such an outrageous thing? I, mother, am nobody to do so, said the youth. But you now, that's another matter. I want you to go to the emperor and ask for the princess for a daughter-in-law. We can well imagine how the poor old thing felt. The boy Anwa was, it is true, the apple of her eye. But surely he was showing far too much recklessness and even rudeness in having such ambitions. Nonsense, she said, and set him to do so much work that for a time he forgot his plan. Then something reminded him again. He badgered his mother until she gave up, packed a bag with a few essentials, and made her way to the capital of the empire. Day after day the poor woman loitered near the palace, where she saw the glittering guard ride forth, the embassies from far-off lands arrive and depart, the towering walls behind which sat, in his throne room, the emperor himself. There was plenty of excitement in the streets, as there always is in a capital city. Processions and people of importance were everywhere, and both of them, in their own proper place, were for the edification of the people. But how does one actually get into the presence of such a person as the emperor? She tried and tried and tried, and then she thought, if the emperor won't let me go to him, I must wait until he comes to me. So she stationed herself day and night outside the great mosque to which the emperor rode on a white horse to pray on Fridays. There was always a large crowd there, but after a time the old woman became known as the one who sat at a certain point. She chose this spot because it was just where the ruler turned his horse after mounting it. One Friday, then, she was sitting quietly in her usual position when, as the emperor put his foot into the stirrup and glanced in her direction, she raised her hands in supplication. "'Have that woman brought to the palace,' ordered the monarch as soon as he saw her gesture. In a few moments, she was beside him in the throne room. "'You are a poor woman, I can see.' said his majesty, 
and you had better speak if you seek a boon from me. But the woman was so awestruck by the place and by being actually talking to the great man that although she opened her mouth, no sound came forth from it. So the emperor ordered that she be given a bag of gold and shown the door. These people can always do with money, he said to his courtiers. When the old lady returned home, her son said, Did you see the emperor? Indeed I did, Anwar. Did you appeal to him? I did. Did you enter his presence? Yes. And what did he say to my proposal of marriage to his daughter, the princess Salma? Foolish boy, how could I, dressed in rags and without any of the manners of the court, say a thing like that? I said nothing, for I was overcome with the splendor of the place. But his imperial majesty was more than kind, and has given us this bag heavy with gold. You can use it to set yourself up in trade, and that will give you a good career and a lifetime's fulfillment. Forget all this nonsense about princesses. Mother, I don't want gold, I want the princess, said Anwa. He continued to pester her until she was forced to set off once again to the capital. There the emperor saw her again sitting in the corner. He called her to him and again asked her what she wanted. Again she was too frightened to speak. Again he gave her a bag of gold and sent her away. And the same thing happened when she returned to her humble cottage with Anwa not at all reconciled after all the emperor's kindness. Finally Anwa said to his mother, I have decided not to stay at home. I've decided not to accept the comfortable life which the gold would give me. I've decided to seek the emperor's daughter, and I shall therefore set off tomorrow morning to find out how I can win her. The next day, as dawn broke, he left the house and started to walk along the road through the woods. As the road turned at the top of a hill, Anwa came across a wise man sitting by the way with a pointed cap on his head his robe made up of small squares of rag carefully stitched together. "'Peace upon you, your presence, dervish,' said Anwar politely. "'And what do you seek, little brother?' asked the dervish. "'I am seeking the way in which I can approach the emperor and ask for the hand of his daughter in marriage, for I have set my heart upon it,' said Anwar. "'That is difficult,' said the wise man, "'unless you are first prepared to learn the skill that nobody has.' How can there be such a thing if it is called the skill that nobody has, asked the youth. Nobody has it because people do it, said the dervish, and they can only do it when they have something, some other things. When they have the things, the skill works for them, so they don't really have to have it. This is extremely difficult, said Anwar, but, but can you tell me how to go about it? Yes, indeed, said the old man. You keep straight on, allowing nothing to deflect you, sticking to the same road and not thinking that anything is more important than the road. Anwar thanked the dervish and went on his way. The road led him on and on, and he lived as best he could on wild fruits, roots and berries, and the kindness of various people whom he met. From time to time people suggested that he should take up employment with them or interest himself in their crafts and occupations, or even marry their daughters, but Anwar kept on, although after a very long time he began to feel more and more that the road was leading nowhere at all. And then one day, as it was coming to nightfall, Anwa saw that the road did indeed end. That is to say, instead of passing a certain towering fortress, it led straight within the walls through a wide gate. Anwa followed it in. The gatekeeper challenged him. What do you seek? I am in search of the princess who I am determined to marry, answered Anwar. You cannot pass unless you have a more reasonable object than that, shouted the guard at the gate, and he levelled a sharpened spike at poor Anwar. Anwar said, Well then, I am going to learn the skill that nobody has. That's different, said the guard, lowering his weapon. But, he added sulkily, someone must have told you about it, because people usually imagine they can approach the princess direct. Anwar went on his way and found himself inside the grounds of the enormous castle. In a small pavilion in the grounds was a silent figure sitting in contemplation. As Anwar approached him, he saw that it was the very same dervish whom he had met on the road those many moons ago. "'As you have arrived here at last without taking any notice of the temptations of the road,' said the dervish, "'you may undergo the next test.' He showed Anwar into a long, low meditation hall, 
where rows of silent dervishes were reposing, their heads on their knees. Anwar sat down. Then the dervishes started to perform exercises, and Anwar found himself compelled to emulate them. When this was over, he was assigned to the master gardener, and made to work digging and hoeing, watering and pruning, tending plants and cutting paths, until his hands were as sore as his back ached, and all this continued for many months. Next he was taken to the room of the master of the monastery, and had to go there every day for hours on end, while the great man looked at him, saying nothing. This continued for many more months. After that Anwar was assigned to the kitchens, where he worked like a slave, preparing food for the hundreds of dervishes who lived in the precincts, and for the people who constantly visited the monastery, as well as for the many festivals which were conducted by the brethren. At times Anwar felt that he was being useful, at other times that he was wasting his own time, for he thought constantly about the princess, and also about the skill that nobody has but worse still lay before him. That was when he had no work at all to do. He was not invited to take part in the dervish's exercises. He had no place in the kitchens, and he was not wanted in the gardens. Many other men came and went. Most of them seemed happy enough. But in conversations with them, he could not learn much about the community and what the meaning was of its activities. Indeed, whether there was any meaning at all. Then, one day, after some years, Anwar was called into the presence of the master of the monastery. As he reached the hujra, the room where the master interviewed people, he saw that the old man was about to fall into a well, which suddenly opened up in the middle of the floor. Anwar just managed to save him. "'My son,' said the sage, handing him a key, "'take this key and look after it with your life.' Anwar went on working at the monastery until he was called into the presence of the chief of the gardeners, and he saw that a tree was toppling and was about to fall on that sage's head. Anwar just managed to prevent that happening and saved the man's life. "'My son,' said the head gardener, "'take this crystal pebble and guard it with your life.' He went back to work and was called after a very long time to the presence of the chief of the kitchens. When he got there, he saw that the man was about to lift a burning hot ladle from a pot on the fire. Anwar snatched it first and was burned on the thumb. My son, said the chief of the kitchens, you will now have a callus at the base of that thumb. Guard it with your life. After many more months in the monastery, Anwar was called into the assembly hall where all the dervishes were sitting having dinner. At the head of the table sat a haughty prince with a very superior mien and dressed in glorious robes. As everyone listened, the prince told a long and complicated story. As if it were within him, Anwar heard the prince's voice say, Remember this story, and guard it with your life. Many days after this, Anwar was told to go to the place in the garden where he had first seen the dervish. When he got there, the old man was sitting as before in contemplation. Raising his head, he said, Anwar, you are now ready to continue with your quest. You will succeed, for I have given you the skill that nobody has. But, but I don't understand, said Anwar. If you think that you do, said the sage, you do not. If on the other hand you think that you do not, you can exercise it without interference. I still don't understand, said Anwar. If you had left us, you would never have learnt, said the dervish. And if I drive you out, you will learn. If you try to come back, you will not learn. If you need help, I will appear. Well, why is that? asked Anwar in some confusion. Because, apart from certain things which you have, I am part of the skill, which cannot stay with you, so it has to be kept in me. So Anwar set off towards the gate of the fortress, and as he came up to the guardian of the entrance and looked at his face, he saw that he was the same man as the dervish who had been talking to him. Just outside stood the chief of the gardens, the head of the kitchen, and the chief of the monastery, and all the other people whom he had met since he entered the place. Each and every one of them had the face of the dervish whom he had first met on the roadside near the top of the hill after he left his mother's cottage. I shall never be able to understand this, said Anwar to himself, but he continued on his way. 
When he looked back, he saw that the monastery was no longer there, and even the road before him had changed. Instead of leading backwards towards his home, it ran in a completely different direction. Anwar continued along it nonetheless. After many days, he came upon a huge and brilliantly lit city, and asked what it was. This said a passerby is the capital of the empire, no less. Anwar asked him how many years had passed since the year in which he had set out, and the man looked at him oddly. Why, only a single year, he said. By Anwar's own reckoning, he had spent more than thirty years in that monastery, so he realized that in some strange way, time was not the same everywhere. In the center of the city, Anwar came across a deep well and heard cries coming from it. A rope ran down into the well, and he started to haul it up. A crowd gathered as he was straining with his utmost strength, and he almost let the rope go, but he was able to sustain the terrible chafing through the callus on his thumb. Finally, a man emerged from the well. He thanked Anwar and said, "You must be the man from afar about whom it is prophesied that he alone will be able to save me. I am the chief minister of his imperial majesty." Imprisoned in the well by a genie, and I will see that you are rewarded. So saying, he went his way. Anwar was still rather surprised by this when a strange and fearsome figure jumped upon him. Ha ha! It said, "Son of man, you are my prey, and I shall eat you alive as I do every one in this city whom I desire to devour. We genies are in control of the streets of the capital, and nobody can resist us except people who have earned the crystal pebble of Suleiman, son of David." Which binds all genies on the earth. Hearing this, Anwar snatched the pebble crystal from his pocket and held it before the genie, who immediately dissolved into flashes of fire and scuttled away far into the distance. No sooner had he done this than a man on horseback came galloping up to him and said, "I am the emperor's herald. It has been foretold that any one who can rescue the minister may be able to overcome the genies." Such a man may well have earned the key to the enchanted room in which the princess is imprisoned. The man who can open that door is to be her husband and to rule the realm when his imperial majesty is no more. Anwar mounted behind him, and they sped to the palace. The man took him to a room where Anwar fitted the key to the lock. The door swung open, and there he saw the most beautiful lady whom human eyes had ever beheld. It was, of course, the princess, and she came forward, and the pair fell in love the instant their eyes met. And so it was that Anwar, the poor boy from the cottage in the remote province, became the husband of the princess Salma, and emperor too in the fullness of time, and he and his consort are reigning there yet. The story which the haughty prince at the monastery table told them, they found, contained all the elements for a just, peaceful, and successful rule. And when they, their country, or their children were faced with any difficulties, they found that they had the skill that nobody has, for they were able to use their experience, the magical objects given to them, and the advice of the mysterious dervish who always appeared and advised them. When they needed him.